Also this morning, slow burn. Right now, thousands of Burning Man attendees are making their escape from the Nevada desert after heavy rains left them stranded for days. All right, you made it out. I know it. <laughs> I'm so grateful. It's one for the ages, that's for sure. But getting out won't be easy. We'll show you the conditions as they make the hours-long journey home. Plus, September swelter. That's right, summer's not over just yet. This morning, tens of millions of Americans are waking up to heat alerts stretching from the Midwest to the Northeast. We are tracking which areas are expecting to break records today. And cut to the chase. You've heard of quiet quitting. Now a new trend is taking over the workplace. It's called quiet cutting, when workers are reassigned to different roles as part of corporate restructuring. More on the moves, the impacts, and what you can do if you've been impacted. Well, the mass exodus continues this morning at the Burning Man Festival. Organizers reopened the road leading out of the remote Nevada desert area yesterday. But then traffic, look at these pictures, stretched for miles with drivers being asked to delay their departure until today. Unexpected rain had turned the fe festival into a muddy nightmare. Nearly 70,000 people were ordered to stay put for days and conserve food and water even as officials closed the roads. NBC's Liz Kreutz has more. With thousands urgently waiting to leave, signs the exodus at Burning Man has begun. We're making it out. <laughs> After days stuck in this mud-soaked desert, the weather drying up. Festival goers, known as burners, finally getting the go-ahead to get out. All right, you made it out. I know it. <laughs> I'm so grateful. The traffic backing up by early morning. The rush visible for miles. Around camp, there's still pockets of mud like this, wet and sticky. It's what officials are worried about as burners begin their exodus. An unusual summer storm turning the annual desert campout into a muddy mess. More than 70,000 trapped, some hiking miles to get out. The local sheriff probing the death of one person during the rain event. The cause still under investigation, but organizers say it was not storm related. People need, are going to need to be patient. Following calls to shelter in place and conserve supplies, Burning Man CEO telling attendees who've been stranded for days to remain calm. We've made it really clear that we do not see this as an evacuation situation. It's a tradition going back nearly 40 years. The counterculture festival in the remote Nevada desert celebrating art, music and community. It's one for the ages, that's for sure. With the line to leave taking hours, some finding it hard to get out. There was a taxi. He said he can take us to Reno by the meter and it's going to be $500 or more. At the Reno airport, others still stunned. I was scared. The harrowing conditions. You can smell like it's a burning rubber and mud. <laughs> putting even the most self-reliant to the test. And some attendees told us it took them six hours to get from the heart of Black Rock City just here to the exit. Festival organizers are asking people to stagger when they leave to try to prevent congestion. Back to you. All right, Liz, thank you so much. Record-breaking heat continues to impact 42 million Americans today. So for a closer look, let's get a check at your Morning News Now weather forecast. That's right. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. And that number has jumped up to 47 million, and that's across the Northeast, the Great Lakes, into the Midwest, also across the South. So in the South, we're going to have heat indices right around 110, 115, and the Northeast is going to feel like over 100 degrees. So the heat goes on today. It was a hot one yesterday. It's going to be hot once again tomorrow. It's going to be a slow trek to cooler weather later on uh, this weekend. So more than 80 records are possible from the Midwest into the Great Lakes and Northeast. Temperatures soaring into the upper 90s and places like D.C. It's going to feel like 101 there, feeling like 103 in Raleigh, feeling like 97 in Grand Rapids. But notice this blue line, that cold front off to the left. Left. That's going to move through. It's going to spark some storms today in the upper Midwest, but it's going to bring some relief, and that's going to bring the slow relief into the Northeast by this weekend. So for tomorrow, we're looking at temperatures once again into the 90s, into the 100s. D.C. will feel like 103 tomorrow. Cape Hatteras feeling like 96. And Fayetteville, you're going to feel like 104. And then as we go throughout Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 
feeling better Thursday, uh, excuse me, Friday and Saturday in Baltimore. Temperatures into the 80s, New York City, 82 by Saturday. Same story in Boston. And look back to the West, Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, that cold front already going through by Wednesday. So feeling like 80, it's going to be 83 on Thursday by Friday, 80 degrees and 74 on Saturday. Here's that cold front that's going to move through. through. It's going to bring the chance for storms across the upper Midwest. And it's going to bring that relief too. But in the meantime, we're going to see the threat for strong storms today. Winds could gust near 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail, the chance for some storms. And then tomorrow, that cold front stretches from Michigan to Mississippi. And we could see some heavy rainfall along this front as well because it's going through that really warm, humid air mass. And that's where we could see locally up to two inches of rain. For today, 5 million people at risk for severe storms. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, especially where you see that yellow. Places like Duluth, also Minneapolis, could see some strong storms, especially this afternoon and this evening. An isolated tornado is possible. It's on the low side, but we still could see one or two as we head throughout this evening. And then there's that cold front tomorrow. Easy to see where it stretched. It stretched from Michigan all the way down to portions of the Tennessee Valley. So Nashville, Indianapolis, Detroit, Memphis could see some strong storms. Kind of in the same scenario, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, some hail, a chance of a tornado or two. And it's going to be heavy rainfall as well, especially where you see those brighter colors, Duluth, Minneapolis, near Green Bay. This is through Wednesday. So over the next couple of days, we're looking at that locally heavy rain. Now, the tropics are heating up as well. We are looking at our next name storm almost. It's almost a definite. We're looking at Invest 95L, the National Hurricane Center, kind of denotes storms that will develop. It's moving into an area that is conducive for development. So over the next two days, we have a 90% chance of getting our next name storm. It could happen today. It could happen uh, sooner than that. And then we have a 100% chance in the next seven days. So it's a good bet that we will have our next storm, whether it's a tropical depression, tropical storm, and then eventually a hurricane. This is going to be one to watch, guys, as we go throughout the next couple of days. And then we'll see it kind of develop throughout the Caribbean. Back to you. All right. As always, Michelle, thank you so much. See you in a little bit. Well, now to Texas, where a community is in mourning today following the deadly shooting of a TCU football player. As NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster explains, police say it was a random attack by a gunman looking to kill. This tragedy happened just a few weeks after the start of classes and the day before the first football game of the season. Wes Smith was honored at that game with a moment of silence as a community and family grieves. The family of Wes Smith speaking out after the Texas Christian University student was killed. It's hard to, to get your heart around it, to get your head around it, so it's certainly been shocking. Police say Smith was killed outside a Fort Worth bar after being approached apparently randomly by suspect Matthew Purdy. This was just something that was senseless um, and it shouldn't have happened. According to the arrest warrant, Purdy admitted to shooting Smith three times in the stomach, shoulder, and back of the head after he fell. The suspect telling police he wanted to make sure he was dead. Investigators say Purdy also hit a witness with his gun and told officers he would have shot others if he had not run out of ammunition. Purdy, who was out on probation for aggravated robbery, according to police, is now charged with murder. He's in custody where he belongs. Smith was a double major in finance and strategic marketing, a walk-on for TCU football his freshman year, and a student who led Bible studies for his fraternity, his family says. He wanted to be an encouragement to other people. He wanted to be a friend to other people. People just naturally gravitated toward him as a leader and a person that made them feel better about themselves. Without a known motive, a family and community has left heartbroken and confused. The family says services for West Smith will take place on September 15th and 16th. They're calling it a celebration of his life. Meanwhile, the first court date for Purdy has not yet been set. He's still being held on a $500,000 bond. Back to you. All right, Shaquille Brewster, thank you so much. There are new developments this morning in the search for an escaped inmate in Pennsylvania. It's been six days since he broke out of prison, but officials say they believe they're closing in on him and they're also enlisting his mother to help find him. NBC News correspondent George Solis joins us now with the latest on the search this morning. George, good morning to you. Good morning, Valerie. Yeah, things just as tense as ever. There have been multiple sightings of convicted killer Daniano Cavalcante. The road closures here are changing almost by the second, but authorities are confident he is still likely in this area and very much on the run. This morning, Pennsylvania State Police officially taking over the manhunt, saying they're confident they're closing in on convicted killer Daniello Cavalcante. I want to push him hard. He'll make mistakes. 
Three days ago, police releasing this doorbell cam video of the 5 foot 120 pound fugitive. Authorities indicating there have now been four confirmed sightings within a two mile radius of the Chester County Prison where Cavalcante escaped Thursday morning. This most recent sighting taking place over the long holiday weekend. It was uh, a trooper actually that observed him uh, in some distance, uh, gave chase but was unable uh, because of the terrain and some, some other obstacles there was unable to get to him. Authorities believe Cavalcante is hiding out in a heavily wooded area and growing more desperate as they close in. The only thing I had to defend myself was a picture frame. Brian Drummond believes his home may have been one of those hiding spots. Drummond, after seeing an intruder, flickered the lights to show he knew someone was there. And then he flipped the light switch back a few times, which was the real panic moment. Drummond and his wife called 911, and he says he watched the man leave his house. How hard was your heart racing? It was like a moment of disbelief. You know, it's like, yes, my heart was beating fast. Cavalcante was convicted last month and sentenced to life in prison for the brutal stabbing death of his ex-girlfriend. Authorities say he's also wanted for a 2017 homicide in his native Brazil. Police have been playing audio recordings from choppers and patrol cars of Cavalcante's mother speaking in Portuguese, pleading for her son to turn himself in. They're also asking residents to remain vigilant. We're just scared, you know, paranoid. paranoid. Yeah, we're ready for it to be over. And to call police if they see anything suspicious. Guys and authorities still aren't saying how Cavalcante escaped from the Chester County Prison, but state police did say they have been authorized to use deadly force if necessary. And mind you, there's still a $10,000 reward for any information that leads to his capture. Valerie? All right, yes, so many people on edge there. George Solis, thank you so much. Wow. And the music world is mourning the loss of popular singer Steve Harwell, the lead singer of the Grammy-nominated band Smash Mouth. He died at his home in Idaho Monday. The band said he had been suffering from acute liver failure. Harwell and Smash Mouth hit the peak of their popularity in the early 2000s with hits like Walking on the Sun, maybe best known for their hit single All Star. That was forever made famous as the opening to the movie Shrek. Steve Harwell was 56 years old. Coming up on Morning News Now, a health scare at the White House. First Lady Jill Biden has tested positive for COVID-19. Later this hour, what we know about her condition and the precautions being taken. Up first, though, after the break, an alarming alliance between Russia and North Korea. What U.S. officials are saying about a planned meeting between the two countries' leaders. We'll be right back. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wants the immediate deportation of Eritrean asylum seekers involved in recent violent clashes in Tel Aviv. He's also ordered a plan to remove all African migrants from Israel. The drastic measures come after rival Eritrean protesters were involved in riots over the weekend. NBC's Matt Bradley has the latest. Violent clashes in Tel Aviv putting the country's immigration policies front and center. Get up, get up, get up. After hundreds of asylum seekers from the African country of Eritrea confronted pro-Eritrean government groups. Israeli police stepped in, deploying tear gas, stun grenades, and even live rounds into the crowd after officers said they felt their lives were in danger. The confrontations come as Eritrea's totalitarian government marks 30 years in power. Why did we run from our country, said this protester? Because this dictator. It's a government many demonstrators in Israel say they were forced to flee. I feel sad because uh, I saw a lot of people have been injured. The Israeli National Emergency Service reports over 100 people were injured in the clashes, including 30 police officers. Prime Minister Netanyahu says the protesters crossed a line. His national security minister visited the scene and suggested that those who took part should be placed in detention until they're deported. Immigration has been a divisive issue in Israel for generations. But it's taken on new urgency as Netanyahu seeks to push through his judicial overhaul plan. The nation's high court has previously blocked laws targeting Eritrean asylum seekers. Now Netanyahu is sticking to his long-standing rhetoric, calling those who protested over the weekend illegal infiltrators. Our thanks to Matt Bradley for that report. We don't know what this potential mass deportation plan would look like right now, but Netanyahu is backed by one of the most conservative cabinets in Israeli history, which is opposed to immigration. And more international headlines now, starting with reports of a possible alliance between Russia and North Korea. Josh Lederman joins us now with that and more. Hey, Josh, good morning. 
Hey, good morning. That is right. A, a potential meeting between President Putin of Russia and President Kim Jong-un of North Korea could take place as early as this month, according to U.S. officials who say the most likely location for that meeting would be in Vladivostok along Russia's Pacific coast. The White House is now confirming to NBC News they believe this is part of Moscow's efforts to persuade Pyongyang to sell ammunition and other weapons to Russia to use in its war in Ukraine. Now to Spain, where at least three people have died after torrential rains that triggered flash floods in many parts of the country. You can see it right there on your screen. They had to close roads and trains for their safety. People are missing, about three people they believe still missing. And authorities deployed their mobile phone alert system for extreme storm risks for the first time. And finally, back here to London, where the late Queen Elizabeth is being remembered for one of her great loves. Royal fans held a corgi parade outside Buckingham Palace as the one-year anniversary of her death approaches this week. They even dressed up their dogs in royal regalia in honor of the Queen's famous love of corgis. All I'm going to say is I wish I had that much free time on my hands, guys. <laughs> Who doesn't love a dog parade? Wow, two things there, adorable, but also I can't believe it's almost been a year. Wow, oh my goodness. Josh Letterman, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, now to Texas, where this morning, for only the third time in history, a state official will have an impeachment trial. This is Texas Attorney General. His name's Ken Paxton, and he faces 20 articles of impeachment, including bribery and abuse of office. Paxton, a Republican, was impeached by the Republican-controlled Texas House back in May. Later this morning, the Texas Senate will convene to try his case. Paxton has denied any wrongdoing and calls the allegations politically motivated. NBC News senior reporter Jane Tim joins us with more on what we can expect. Hey, Jane, good morning. So first, just explain to us, how did we get to this point? I mean, I mentioned he's a Republican. This is the Republican controlled house. What was it that was going on here? What is he accused of doing? Good morning. So Ken Paxton's uh, impeachment trial today is going to center around whether or not he accepted bribes from and abused his office in trying to help a friend and political donor named Nate Paul. Now, this isn't actually a whole lot of it's not entirely news to Texans. These allegations of wrongdoing have been circulating for years. Paxton's own senior staff reported him to the FBI in 2020. Uh, but the House didn't start investigating until this spring after Paxton asked them to to pay for a settlement with some of these uh, whistleblowers who had reported him to the FBI for employment retaliation. Now, that was a $3.3 million settlement and apparently the last straw for Paxton's own party, who joined with Democrats in the House of Representatives to overwhelmingly impeach him on these 20 uh, articles of impeachment. So give us some details on what exactly we're going to see. So this impeachment trial is at the Texas State Capitol in Austin, like I said, convening later this morning. What can we expect from proceedings? Who can we expect to see testify? So the Senate now has to decide whether or not to convict him on those articles of impeachment. The, the Senate, those senators are the jury here. Uh, and the trial is going to look a lot like a, a, a civil or, or criminal trial trial, uh, except opening statements, witness. Um, and for as for witnesses, watch today. We're going to see a really interesting picture into many of these witnesses uh, who will have to appear in person at 11 a.m. There's more than 100 people have received subpoenas to testify. So I'll be watching to see who shows up today at the Capitol. Absolutely. And Jane, finally, how would he be replaced if convicted? So Texas law says an unexpired term can only be filled by a special election. But the real question is, if the senators do vote to impeach him, do they also vote to bar him permanently for office? Or can he mm -hmm. run again in that special election? Lots to watch for. Jane Tim, thank you so much. President Biden used the Labor Day holiday to tout his record on helping to turn the economy around. While touring a manufacturing plant in Philadelphia, the president met with union leaders and touted the latest jobs numbers, saying that the country is in a period of growth. Well, we're getting through this one of the greatest job creation periods in American history. For real, that's a fact. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us now from the White House with more on yesterday's speech. We'll get to that in just a moment. But Peter, last night the White House said First Lady Jill Biden had tested positive for COVID. What can you tell us about how she's doing this morning? 
Yeah, that's really driving the conversation here at the White House today. Of course, the First Lady's office says Dr. Biden is experiencing mild symptoms that she'll remain at the couple's home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. The president is going to be here at the White House. This is the second time that Jill Biden has had COVID. The first was last August. The president, you'll remember back then, had it weeks earlier. It, it comes after a Saturday trip together to Florida, where both President Biden and the First Lady toured the disaster zone after Hurricane Adelia, meeting with local leaders and residents. They spent Sunday together in Rehoboth. The White House Press Secretary, Corrine Jean-Pierre, she says that the president tested negative last night, that he will be tested at a regular cadence this week, Valerie, while monitoring for symptoms. The president is scheduled to leave, notably, this Thursday, just a few days away, a couple days away, for a high-stakes G20 summit with world leaders. Leaders, no indication right now that her COVID is going to affect his travels unless, of course, he winds up testing positive here. For now, his public schedule is unchanged. Today, he is set to award the Medal of Honor to an Army veteran here at the White House. Peter, so getting back to the president's speech in Philadelphia yesterday, President Biden never mentioned former President Trump by name, but he took some sharp swings at his record. What were some of the main points that Biden brought up? Well, you, you highlight what I think was really the critical difference in this speech. The president focuses on similar uh, points in many of his public remarks, talking about the job creation under his watch, trying to focus uh, on inflation coming down. But yesterday was notable because the president did, without using uh, his predecessor's name, really take some shots at former President Trump, who obviously is facing four indictments right now and has ramped up his criticism of uh, President Biden. Here's part of what we heard from the president just yesterday. Great real estate builder, the last guy here, he didn't build a damn thing. He was one of, oh, but here's an important point, one of two presidents who left office with fewer jobs in America than when he got elected office. And the last guy was here, he looked at the world from Park Avenue. I look at it from Scranton, Pennsylvania. I look at it from Claymont, Delaware. So this is sort of an early preview of what a general election back and forth might look like. Notably, the Republicans haven't even picked out their nominee officially yet, but based on all polling, Donald Trump leads by 40, even 50 points, according to some of these polls. So things already beginning to heat up between former President Trump and President Biden, Valerie. Yeah, and President Biden referring to him as that last guy. So did the Trump campaign respond to President Biden's speech? And you mentioned some polling. We understand there's a new Wall Street Journal poll that has the two candidates in a virtual tie. Yeah, you're right. So the two candidates are in this virtual tie. Of course, these polls are notable, but broadly not that significant because elections aren't decided nationally to decide it in the key battleground states. Really only a few battleground states that are likely to define and decide the 2024 election. The Trump campaign has railed, as it did again just yesterday, at uh, President Biden, criticizing him on all things, including his handling of the economy right now, which has the potential to be a weak spot for the president. The White House, for its part, has been focusing on what it describes as Bidenomics, highlighting a lot of the president's achievements since taking office. But in many of my travels around the country in recent months, Americans right now aren't necessarily feeling those gains. The White House says that there's likely to be a lag before regular Americans start to feel the benefits of some of the president's policies. Valerie. All right. Peter, thank you so much. Well, coming up, an act of heroism caught on camera. A man risking his life to fight the flames while escaping last month's wildfires on Maui. Hear his story and why some say he may have saved an entire block of homes. Plus, why researchers say more screen time and less sleep might mean big problems for kids heading back to school. We'll have your weekly check-in next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. It's been nearly a month now since wildfires devastated the Hawaiian island of Maui, and now untold stories are emerging from the ashes. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock spoke with one man who may have saved an entire block of homes in a dramatic act of heroism. I want you to record everything when we're leaving. Right from those first heart-stopping moments, Jessica and Stephen Pickering knew their time was precious, leaving Lahaina with flames on their heels. Oh, my God. And a wall of smoke in the rearview mirror. We tried to get out of the neighborhood, but were blocked by cars. Along the way, they spot a flash of fire in the bushes. Oh, my God. It's right there in the bushes. What? The fire! Oh, it's in the bushes! 
Stephen leaps from the car to put out the flames, threatening a complete stranger's house. Stephen, we're going to get stuck. Were you thinking at all, this is crazy and it could cost us our lives? Yes. But what did his actions actually end up doing? I think that he saved that area of the neighborhood. Oh. The Pickerings say they barely survived without emergency sirens or even a text to warn them. I haven't personally heard of a single notification that anybody received in all of my social network, period. Out of how many people do you think that you've talked to? Hundreds. Hundreds. Maui County's response is under investigation, though officials have maintained that they warned residents through text and police loudspeakers in neighborhoods, but they haven't specified where or when. Always better safe than sorry. Lies and safety over structure anytime. C. Ray Beltran spent more than 15 years with the Maui Emergency Management Agency as a senior safety official. I would have said full evacuation. In the morning? In the morning, knowing the winds are this high. They're, they're super high. Prepare for the worst and then hope for less. The road to recovery looks long for Jessica and Stephen. One of their Maui diving shops went up in flames along with about a million and a half dollars worth of inventory. Having to say that we have nothing and hold your hand out and ask for help is really humbling and hard. Still, there's a soulful silver lining across town in the Smith household where Drew Smith recognized something familiar on go. social media. I said, honey, come in here. Look at this. There's a guy saving the house. I said, oh, my God, it's, it's our neighborhood. And then we started looking. We're like, this is our house. Smith says he's putting the pickerings in his will. As for Stephen and Jessica, they have their lives and their love. Oh, my God, it's right there in the bushes. And a whole bunch of neighbors ready to help them out if they ever need a hand. Sam Brock, NBC News, Lahaina. Oh, wow. Looks like he didn't think twice. He just no, ran. I mean, oh, and putting him in there well. Wow, that was incredible. But it's time now for our weekly mental health check-in, and we're taking a closer look at the risk for mental health disorders and what you can do to help lower your chances. Yeah, plus it's back to school time. That means back to bedtime routines. We're going to take a look at how screen time could be causing major disruptions to your child's sleep. Let's bring in Dr. George James. For more on these mental health headlines, licensed marriage and family therapist, someone, of course, you recognize, Dr. James. Great to have you with us, as always. So we'll get to all that back to school stuff in just a moment. But first, I want to start with this new study found an estimated 50 percent of the global population will experience at least one mental health disorder by the time they are 75 years old. What do you make of that number? Does that sound like a lot too? Does it sound like a little based on what you know about how we're all doing with mental health? I mean, and tell us what we need to know here if they're different between men and women and how to pr maybe prevent something like this. Yeah, good morning, Savannah. Uh, yes, this does sound like a lot, but when we really look at it, uh, this is a study of 150,000 throughout 29 countries, and it looked to just say over the course of a lifetime, up to about 75, people will experience some type of mental health uh, disorder or challenge. And, you know, that's actually just, that's probably more of what we've realized, but it's now a study that's shown that, whether it be depression and the difference between men and women is that both men and women will have some type of depression or phobia, but men will uh, experience some alcoholic abuse while women will experience some PTSD. So these are things that we know, and we want to prevent that. So we want to get some treatment early and make sure that you get the support you need. So important. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. James, let's talk back to school. We know schedules are in full swing, and for many parents, that means getting back on that regular bedtime routine, but they could be battling kids with their phones, obviously mm. staying up late. New research shows children are getting less sleep because of an increase in screen time. So how important is sleep for tweens and teens, and how can parents talk to their kids about really limiting the time on their phones? Oh, I know this battle all too well. Uh, you know, so <laughs> screen time has been one of those challenges uh, for for lots of families. But screen time has been linked to mental health for everyone, adults including kids. Mm -hmm. What happens with screen time? It does impact your ability to go to sleep, and then with the lack of sleep, it does impact your mental health, like depression and anxiety. There's a relationship between mental health and sleep. So it's really important to try to get your kids to go to bed early so that they can get rest, so that they can push past and perform well in school and be a alert and not be overwhelmed and anxious because they didn't get enough sleep. 
Yeah, I think it's really important that link between using the phone and the either instead of sleep, right? Like the doom scroll at night or it making it more difficult to go to sleep as well as then we know that harmful content that could be consumed. So, so many things there to keep eyes out for. Um, Dr. James, also in the vein of back to school. So, I mean, we are talking generally about mental health kids and teens. It's sort of out of low. We've seen a lot of scary studies, a lot of scary stats coming out of emergency rooms, but it does seem that being in person for school could have a positive impact, which is some good news. Tell Tell us why that is and how parents can support their kids this school year. Yeah, we, we've recognized that being in person, there's just something that's different. A lot of our teens and young adults uh, really struggled and suffered. Uh, they weren't able to do the normal things. They weren't able to engage with each other or be around folks, and especially being able to get that additional academic and emotional support. When schools have provided uh, that one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection, whether it be tutoring, whether it be another uh, uh, teacher, or even being able to see a school counselor, that has helped because we've seen that our young young folks are resilient and able to come back. So it's important that we have the services, but it's also that we believe in them and know that they can re recover from any difficult situations like COVID. Absolutely. Dr. George James, as always, we appreciate you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Coming up, worries in the workplace over a new trend that's pushing some employees out. We'll talk about quiet cutting and what you can do if you believe that you've been impacted. This is Morning News Now. We're back now with a jewelry store robbery caught on camera, but in this case, after a string of recent smash and grab robberies, fed up store employees fought back. NBC's Noah Pransky has the story. Shouting, captured from inside an attempted robbery in Los Angeles. The suspect spraying a worker with what appears to be pepper spray, then once inside, smashes the glass and tries to grab the goods. But the entire store fights back taking matters into their own hands. My dad and my brother started hitting him and then he uh, brings out the pepper spray and then he starts spraying everyone. The man seen running away without any jewelry. Al Monte police still searching for the unidentified suspect. Just days earlier though, a similar incident at a different Los Angeles area jewelry store. Thieves pepper spraying the owner before smashing jewelry cases and getting away with more than a half million dollars in merchandise. They pepper sprayed me on my eyes and my mouth. Typical smash and grab. Yes, they had hammers, smashed the display cases, took what they could, and then ran out the door. Retail theft over the past few months here has grown so rampant. Los Angeles created a new special robbery task force. No Angelino should feel like it is not safe to go shopping in Los Angeles. But some local business owners say they don't feel safe working in Los Angeles either. We're angry and we're like um, also like um, worried about because he, when he left, he turned my brother, he told that he was going to kill all of us, you know? Not to mention just how to pick up the broken pieces. I feel confused. I feel I don't know what I should do tomorrow to come to the store for what? Because most of the jewelry is gone. Noah Pransky, NBC News. Scary stuff there. Uh, financial headlines now. A Danish pharmaceutical company briefly becomes the highest valued company in Europe. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that. Another news. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Valerie. Good morning to you. Yeah, so Nova Nordisk is now the most valuable company in Europe. Thanks to the booming popularity of its weight loss drugs, Ozempic and Wagovi, the Danish drug maker passing French luxury goods giant LVMH with a market value of 420 billion dollars. Now, that's similar to U.S. rival Eli Lilly. And just behind ExxonMobil, Novo stock has run up more than 40 percent this year. Mercedes-Benz is developing a smaller, cheaper version of its hotly anticipated G-Class electric SUV. The company confirming the new baby G-Class EV at a conference in Munich this weekend. Mercedes CEO says it will be significantly more compact than its cousin and will be fun to drive. A new Mercedes G-Class SUV starts at $140,000, but actual pricing on the smaller version is still unknown. Nearly four of five holders of the most lucrative or high-paying bachelor's degrees are men. A new bank rate study also finds that those majoring in the most female-dominated fields 
earned significantly less than male-dominated ones despite progress made in closing the gender gap in the past few decades. The top 20 lucrative degrees are all in STEM, science, tech, engineering, and math, with an average salary above $100,000. And that's why we got to get more women in STEM absolutely. fields. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Savannah Hanau, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Well, you've probably heard of quiet quitting. That's where you show up to your job and you kind of do the bare minimum to squeak by. <laughs> but now a new trend, quiet cutting, could be making an even bigger impact on the job market. Ray Smith is a careers reporter at The Wall Street Journal. He joins us now with more on this latest professional trend. Ray, good morning. Thanks for being here with mm -hmm. us today. Please explain quiet cutting to us and what's behind this trend. What's driving it? Sure. Thank you. Quiet cutting is basically reassigning employees and it's reassigning them either to growing parts of the business and out of slowing parts of the business, or it can be a way to sort of get people to quit because they're so unhappy with the reassignment, the involuntary reassignment, that they'll want to leave rather than stay. So, Ray, as we were just showing, you did this reporting for The Wall Street Journal. You wrote this fantastic article on it. I know you've been talking with people that kind of feel like this is happening to them. What are they telling you? What is the impact of something like this on employees? I mean, I imagine it's not great for performance or morale if you feel like you're maybe kind of being pushed out or minimized somehow in the workplace. Exactly. It can be really, really disorienting. I mean, just imagine being told, you know, you've been doing this thing for a while, and then one day somebody tells you, you know, you're going to be doing something else and it's not your choice and take it or leave it. So right. people I talked with had a range of feelings from relief that they still had a job, but also just anger and um, depression. Even one person told me it took a toll on his mental health. Mm -hmm. And so it can be very disorienting for people to go through this, especially because they have no say in it. And sometimes they're thrown into jobs that you know, they don't have any experience in or it, it doesn't match their skill set. So it's sort of sink or swim. So it can be a really heavy experience. Mm -hmm. Ray, what advice do you have for anyone who may have been a victim of being quietly cut? What should they need to know? Is there any protection or any way that they can fight back? That's a really good question. There's little legal recourse, unfortunately, you know, unless the reassignment was somehow discriminatory and, and you'd have to prove that. But one thing people can do is basically, and I know this doesn't sound great, but, you know, they can take the reassignment and hopefully they can still look internally for a job that will be a better match or something that they'd be more satisfied in. Ray, how widespread is this? Is it certain industries or, or certain, you know, parts of the market that you're really seeing this happen in? And then just how much? I mean, is there any kind of extreme case you've heard of of a company really doing this to a lot of employees? You know, we've seen it in the tech industry, especially because there was a lot of overhiring there in 2021. Mm -hmm. And as the economy turned, they had sort of this, this you know, a lot of people, so much headcount, basically, and overhead. And so they were really trying to reduce headcount. And we saw layoffs in 2022 and early 2023. And now we're seeing, instead of layoffs, reassignments. But it's not just uh, the tech industry that's having reassignments. We saw it in companies like Adidas as well. And so it, it's across industries that are trying to manage cost. And one way they're trying to do that is by reassigning employees, hoping, well, I shouldn't say hoping, but banking on the fact that some employees will not want to take the reassignment and will leave and therefore won't be eligible for severance costs, thousands of dollars in severance costs. Mm. All right, Ray Smith, important reporting there. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today. Something to keep our eyes out for. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. In an unusual move for the music industry, Sean Diddy Combs has reassigned music publishing rights to the artists from the label he founded. That's according to Variety, which is citing a source close to the situation. That means Notorious B.I.G.'s estate, Mace, and Faith Evans are set to get their lucrative rights back from Bad Boy Records. Music catalogs can go for nine figures with recent sales by Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen. The source told Variety Combs sees it as part of a broader goal of promoting economic empowerment for black artists and culture. And I think this is such a great move. What a great thing to do. Absolutely. Very cool. It's so interesting also just to see and understand how the music industry is evolving in terms of people owning their own music, even when it's something that they create is not necessarily the standard, you know? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Valerie. Good 
morning. Happy day after Labor Day. Thanks for being here. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Valerie Castro in for Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, mass exodus. After being stranded in a muddy mess amid torrential downpours this weekend, tens of thousands of festival goers at the Burning Man Festival finally get the green light to leave. But they're facing more setbacks, vehicles lining up for miles, creating an eight-hour wait just to get out. Everything was shut down and getting out was a nightmare. The way to get out is like all, like eight lanes have to merge into one. So it's very slow, it's a really slow process. We've got the latest on where the departures stand this morning. And the heat is on, fall may be a little over two weeks away, but the summer's record-breaking temperatures are not letting up. Millions of Americans are waking up this morning under heat alerts stretching from the upper Midwest to the Northeast and into the Southern Plains. We have your forecast and we'll tell you how long the September sizzler is expected to last. Plus, Alzheimer's awareness. September is World Alzheimer's Month. More than 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's, and we're talking with an expert about the importance of early diagnosis and the resources that are available for those suffering from the disease and their caretakers. And women mean business. In the latest edition of our series, we're introducing you to the designer of Etsy's hottest handbag. She's a trained engineer with an eye for fashion. We'll show you why her sustainable creations are in high demand. Yeah, that's right. It's pretty cool stuff. I'm Sarah Jessica Parker that. is also a fan, yeah. so therefore, there you go. Well, we begin this hour with the relief at Burning Man Festival. Finally, people are able to get out. This mass exodus is finally underway. Thousands of people are now leaving the Nevada desert after organizers reopened the roads yesterday. A massive rainstorm had turned the area into a muddy mess, forcing many to stay put over the weekend. NBC's Liz Kreutz has the very latest from Nevada. We are here at what is known as the gate. It is the main entrance into and out of Burning Man. Less than 24 hours ago, this road here behind me was partially covered in mud, making it hard to get around. But as you can see now, thousands of festival goers are making their way out, leaving a Burning Man they won't soon forget. Mud, muck, and now gridlock. Bye, Burning Man. That was the scene Monday as thousands of burners made their way out of the Nevada desert any way they could. So what's your plan to get out? Uh, hitchhike, get, I don't know. The exodus slow and grinding. A caravan of cars and RVs crawling their way towards civilization. We're making it out. <laughs> the trek out of the slowly drying mud, taking some more than six hours. The backup stretching for miles. This was not how Burning Man was supposed to go. Friday, six days into the week-long festival, celebrating art, music, and community, a deluge turned the dry desert into a giant muddy mess. For some burners, the rain did nothing to dampen their spirit. This has given us the opportunity to rise to radical self-reliance and to support each other in the community. For others, the mud was more than they bargained for. I was scared. I didn't know what we were going to do. Two months of rain in two days, forcing authorities to close roads in and out of the massive pop-up city, stranding thousands. Over the weekend, Burning Man CEO Marion Goodell preaching patience. There's no great chaos. There's no great panic. Some opting to hike out, including celebrities. We ventured out with uh, Josh Kushner and Carly Kloss and Cindy Crawford and Chris Rock and some writers, and we just, we decided all oh, let's go together. DJ Diplo, who's been to 12 Burning Mans, says the six plus mile schlep through the slop was all part of the experience. It felt like we had a little victory, a little battle on that day, and it was, it felt nice. Monday, even amid the exodus, the festival continued undaunted, concluding with its symbolic grand finale, the burning of the man. The Burning Man flame as bright as ever. And authorities have now identified that person who died. They've notified the next of kin. It could take weeks until a cause of death is known, but festival organizers and the sheriff's department say there's no indication it was connected to the weather. Liz Kreutz, NBC News. September continues to sizzle as states across the country see record high heat. For more, let's take a look at your morning news now weather forecast. Michelle Grossman is back with us with that. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, guys. Happy Tuesday. And yeah, we're going to continue to sizzle over the next couple of days, at least in the northeast and also portions of the mid-Atlantic down to the southeast. The southern plains also really warm today. So as we look at the week ahead today, we're looking at the chance for record heat once again from the Great Lakes to the northeast into parts of the mid-Atlantic. And we're going to feel like over 100 degrees in many spots. Hot and humid in the south as well. We have heat advisories there. We're going to feel like 110, 115 in spots. 
And then we're looking at the chance for storms in the upper Midwest and also the upper Great Lakes. Could see some really gusty storms, some strong winds, some hail, even the chance of an isolated tornado or two. Then by tomorrow, we're looking at that cold front that's going to spark the storms today, bring some rain to parts of the Great Lakes into the Tennessee Valley, the lower Mississippi Valley. But those record highs continue in the Northeast, into New England, Mid-Atlantic, still warm once again in the Southern Plains. Lots of sunshine drying out still in the west, so Black Rock City, dry today, dry tomorrow. The extended forecast has lots of sunshine there. And then the storms make it to the northeast by Friday. Eastern storms from New England into the northeast and mid-Atlantic. That's going to bring some cooler weather, too, by Saturday and also Sunday. Really pleasant throughout the northern plains and Midwest. Still hot throughout the southern plains. We're going to look at temperatures into the 100s. So starting with the heat story, this is a big story. We're looking at 47 million people impacted by record-breaking heat, by dangerous heat. Lots of kids headed back to school today in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, the Great Lakes. And we're looking at temperatures uh, dangerous with heat indices over 100 degrees. Dallas, you're under a uh, heat advisory, Corpus Christi, Minneapolis, New York City, also Burlington, Vermont. And this is why we're going to see temperatures soaring into the 90s in so many spots, even into the 100s in Raleigh. It's going to feel like 103 when you factor in that humidity. And it's going to feel like over 100 in D.C. too once you factor in that humidity. There's that cold front off to the west. It's going to sweep through, but it's sweeping through slowly. But as it does, it will bring cooler air. Still, though, Wednesday, we're looking at 90s and 100s in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. 103 is what it's going to feel like in D.C. tomorrow. And then here's that relief into the weekend, Friday and Saturday into the 80s in New York City, low 80s on Saturday. And Pittsburgh, you're into the low 70s. That's going to be really nice, a fall feel this weekend in Pittsburgh. The severe threat today, that's that cold front moving through that warm, really humid air. Five million people at risk with winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail from Duluth to Minneapolis. And then by tomorrow, we'll see that cold front stretching from Michigan all the way down through the Ohio Valley and parts of the Tennessee Valley. So now Detroit, Indianapolis, Nashville under the gun for some strong storms. Same scenario, we see winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour and also the chance for an isolated tornado or two. Can't roll out the chance of some localized flooding, especially where you see those brighter colors, uh, the yellows, the oranges, the reds. We could see locally up to two inches in some spots, and that's with some of the gustier thunderstorms. And the tropics, they are heating up as well. We could have our next name storm today or tomorrow. So we're looking at Invest 95L. It's moving into a really conducive environment. We do expect it to intensify into our next name storm. That would be Lee. So over the next several days, moving into the Caribbean, the Caribbean's really warm. We have low wind shear. Those are two ingredients we need to kind of blossom a storm. And this is what we're looking at. We're looking at a 90% chance. That's pretty good in the next two days to see our next name storm. And then in the next seven days, we're looking at a 100% chance of seeing uh, this blossom into a tropical depression or either a tropical storm. So we will be most likely seeing in the next day or so. Back to you both. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Court proceedings for the Georgia election fraud case are set for tomorrow morning in connection with the Georgia's election interference investigation into former President Trump and several co-defendants. In all, Trump and 18 other people were indicted by the Fulton County District Attorney for their alleged roles. The former president has denied any wrongdoing. He's also pleaded not guilty, and he waived his right to appear in court tomorrow. Attorney and legal analyst Angela Senadella is here to break all this down for us. Hi, always great to see you. So walk us through that detail I just mentioned, waiving his arraignment. Is that common when it's high profile? What does that ultimately mean? Yes, it's very common, especially in a state like Georgia, because it is an option. You can choose to go to your arraignment or not. So why would you want a perp walk in front of all the cameras? Mm -hmm. So we expect the other co-defendants to let likely also waive that right. However, that means prior to the arraignment scheduled for tomorrow, they must enter not guilty or mm. guilty pleas with the court. So that's the biggest question. Will anybody be pleading guilty? Mm. Uh, Trump has moved to have his case separated from the other defendants who have asked for a speedy trial. What's the strategy there from his legal team? And is that something that could actually happen? Yes, it is, absolutely. And that's because the trial judge here has a fair amount of discretion. A trial judge is almost like a referee, just trying to make sure that things are fair in their courtroom. And in this case, people in Georgia have the right to a speedy trial. But also, you have the right to fairness if you feel that you do not have enough time to prepare properly. So that's what his team is arguing for. We also know that his strategy overall for all his cases is pretty much delay, 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 mm -hmm. and hopes he enters the office. So, Angela, in these arraignment proceedings, we know the big thing to watch for. Anybody pleading guilty, kind of like the big red flag there. What happens next after that once we get through that by tomorrow? So. 
a lot of pretrial motions will be filed. We've already seen Mark Meadows filing to have his case removed to federal court because federal court will likely, in this case unusually, be more friendly to the defendants, given that in Georgia, four of the judges were appointed by Trump federally, et cetera. We'll see motions. We'll also see so many backdoor negotiations happening of different people saying, look, it was him, it was her, it was not me. Mm -hmm. And that's where things start to flip. In a RICO case, when you have 19 defendants, they're not all going to go to trial. Some of them, at some point, are going to take a deal, I think. Mm -hmm. Angela Sanadella, as always, thank you so much. Thank you. And let's turn now to the White House, where First Lady Jill Biden has tested positive for COVID-19. This is the First Lady's second COVID diagnosis in just over a year. It comes just days after the Bidens traveled to Florida to survey the damage left behind by Hurricane Adalia. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us now on this. Hey, Peter, good morning. So what do we know about the First Lady's condition this morning? How's she doing? Yes, Vanna, the First Lady's office says that Dr. Biden is experiencing mild symptoms that she'll remain at their home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, while the president is here at the White House. As you noted, this is the second time that Jill Biden has gotten COVID. The first was last August. The president, you'll remember, had it weeks earlier then. Both of them took Pax Paxlovid. Neither of them had serious symptoms. They both had a rebound case, by the way. And it comes after that Saturday trip that you noted together to Florida, where both the president and first lady toured the disaster zone after Hurricane Adelia, meeting with local leaders, with residents there. They spent Sunday together in Rehoboth. The White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre says that the president tested negative last night, that he'll be tested at what they describe as a regular cadence this week while monitoring for symptoms. The president, for his part, Savannah, he's scheduled to leave on Thursday, just 48 hours from now, for what is a critical G20 summit with world leaders. No indication that her COVID is going to affect his travels unless, of course, he ultimately tests positive. For now, his public schedule remains unchanged. Today, he is set to award the Medal of Honor to an Army veteran right here at the White House. Savannah. Peter, a lot of our viewers, I know me, anecdotally, we're feeling it here at NBC, might be noticing, you know, people kind of getting COVID again, the cases ticking up, as is not a surprise as we head into fall and winter and such. But we just haven't really talked about, we haven't been in practice with a lot of the types of protocols in terms of masking or how many days you stay out of work. What's your day zero? What's your day five or 10? What are the latest protocols at the White House? And, and does this mean that the First Lady's in isolation now? It's a good question. Well, she is, in effect, isolated because she's in Rehoboth, so it's not entirely clear who's with her. Certainly the president is with is not with her at this time. We've reached out to the White House to get any specific understanding of how the president is going to be dealing with his close contact, of course, with his wife, whether he will be wearing a mask when he's around others. To the best of our knowledge to this point, anybody who meets with the president, I guess, unless of course, it's his wife, does have to get tested before they meet face to face with him right now. That's been the case for quite a long while. That obviously doesn't necessarily happen when they are on the road and they're greeting individuals as they travel through Florida and elsewhere. It's notable that the First Lady has had a busy schedule in recent weeks. She spent some time last week in Wisconsin. She was meeting with folks. She was scheduled with them back at school here at the community college where she teaches mm -hmm. last week. But certainly we wish her a, a, a quick and easy recovery. Absolutely. Yeah. Peter, you mentioned the president's schedule this week coming up set to travel to India on Thursday. That's for the G20 summit. Just tell us a little bit about what to expect there. Well, the G20 summit obviously is critical for a variety of reasons, but right now as much as ever because it still focuses so heavily on what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, that war with Russia invading Ukraine, you know, now more than a year and a half in at this point, and it comes amid recent headlines where we have seen the expectation that Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, will be meeting with the the with the dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. Some reports that that'll happen uh, in Vladivostok. That's on the eastern side of uh, Russia, not too far from North Korea right now, where the Russians may be reaching out to the North Koreans to try to get assistance in terms of weapons to use in the war in Ukraine. So the president wants to keep all of the allies together, notably the U.S., uh, has been celebrating some victories in that effort broadly and that they've been able to bring in Finland to join NATO right now. NATO, obviously, right on the front lines of this war between Russia and Ukraine today. Peter Alexander, thank you so much.
The summer of strikes may be continuing into the fall. United Auto Workers Union members could walk off the job as early as next week if a deal can't be reached. This comes off the back of high-profile walkouts by the writers and actors unions. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello joins us from outside a car dealership in Rockville, Maryland with the very latest. Tom, good morning. Thanks for being out there with us today. What are the auto workers asking for from automakers? These are very big demands that the United Auto Workers have for the big three. We're talking Ford, we're talking GM and Stellantis, the parent company of Chrysler. The UAW has the following demands, a 46% pay hike. They want to work also a 32-hour week but get paid for 40 hours, and they want a restoration of their benefits, of their pension benefits. Now, the, uh, the big three auto execs say this is, these are unrealistic demands, that they simply can't meet those demands. In fact, already Ford has said they've offered a 9% pay hike to their workers, but that's well below the 46% increase that the UAW is demanding. Tommy, you covered the workers. Let's talk about how the looming strike could affect Americans hoping to buy a vehicle. Well, I think, listen, if you see production lines shut down at the big three car, American car makers, then obviously prices are going to start to move even higher, right? Uh, and that's if you want a new car. If you are coming into a dealership and you want to get your car serviced, you could imagine that if there's a, a, a shortage of parts, then you could see higher prices for servicing. In fact, I just talked to the service manager, pardon me, the parts manager here at this dealership. He said he's been stocking up on parts. He's anticipating that a strike, in fact, will happen. Uh, would they got a, they've got about a week to settle this because the, the contract expires on September 14th. If they don't come to an agreement by then, then we could see 146,000 UAW workers going on strike. A lot of analysts say the union kind of has leverage here because, as you know, we've been reporting there's a shortage of workers nationwide right now and there's high demand for cars. So in that scenario, the union may have leverage over the car companies. We know yesterday President Biden weighed in during a speech to union workers in Philadelphia. What was his message to them? Well, he says he doesn't think that a strike is inevitable, uh, that it's not necessarily going to happen. Again, the analysts, however, think that this is a real possibility. Now, separately, as you know, this has been a summer of strikes and of union action in which very often the unions do get some, some of what they want. Now, still unsettled is the, is the strike involving the, the Screen Actors Guild writers and, and the actors, I should say. That's not settled. But we've seen big negotiations, big showdowns, and then negotiations, negotiations and settlements with, for example, the railroads and UPS. Uh, and so in an environment where, as we've reported, there's a shortage of workers with very low unemployment rate nationwide right now, the union sometimes has the upper hand and they're in an environment in which inflation has been eating into their cost of living. And so they go to their employers and say, listen, we need to make more money or, or we simply can't make ends meet and therefore we will walk off the job if necessary. All right. So many people affected. Tom, thank you so much. Coming up, strengthening ties. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un may travel to Russia to discuss a possible sale of arms with Vladimir Putin, helping to support Moscow's war in Ukraine. We'll discuss what's at stake. And remembering Steve Harwell, tributes are pouring in for the Smash Mouth frontman after he died yesterday at the age of just 56. We are looking back at his career coming up. We're back now with the latest on the ongoing migrant crisis here in the U.S. Yes, yeah, cities nationwide are having difficulty keeping up providing housing for people seeking asylum. There are now growing concerns about overcrowding in schools, particularly here in New York City, as an influx of new students is expected this week when schools open on Thursday. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now from outside a school on Manhattan's Upper East Side that is seeing this increase. Hey, Stephanie, good morning. Hey, Savannah and Valerie, good morning to you guys. School here in New York opens in just a couple of days, and there have been hundreds of migrant families who are looking to enroll their kids in school, but there are limited resources, and there are some parents who are concerned that the school system won't be able to handle the surge. This morning, cities across the country are dealing with an ongoing migrant influx. Here in New York, the school year is set to begin Thursday with a surge of new students. The latest round of asylum seekers and migrants we're receiving, uh, there's a large number of them are children and families. 
Officials say since last July, nearly 19,000 students in temporary housing, many of them migrants, have enrolled in city schools. Under New York state law, all kids between ages 5 and 21 are guaranteed a public education, regardless of their immigration status. We completely changed our school funding formula to provide additional funding to schools based on the number of students in temporary housing that they enroll. But some parents worry schools will be stretched too thin. The problem is, is that we are not equipped to, to help them, and we should be. It comes as a growing number of asylum seekers are arriving in cities nationwide. Many still stuck in crowded temporary housing at hotels and other makeshift shelters. No tent city! No tent city! It's become a flashpoint for residents as more migrants arrive by the busload. Berlin Suarez arrived from Venezuela last month with her three daughters. Her dream, a better quality of life for her and her children. City officials say that they are committed to this school year by a, an additional $110 million to the school budget. They're adding that this year alone. Guys, back to you. All right, Stephanie Gosk, thank you so much. Well, there are reports this morning that a potential meeting between Russian President Vladimir Putin and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un could be in the works. That is according to a U.S. official. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons joins us now for more on this. Hey, Keir, good morning. What are we learning about this potential meeting? What would be discussed if these talks go ahead? What's the crux of this? Well, Svano, it's, a, it's a big deal, uh, clearly, and one measure of how big a deal it is is how uncomfortable the Kremlin uh, sounds this morning. Spokesman Dmitry Peskov refusing in the past few hours to confirm that President Putin plans to meet the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and discuss weapons, answering, we have nothing to say on this topic, while a spokesperson for the National Security Council saying this morning that Kim Jong-un expects leader-level diplomatic engagement in Russia. So, apparently, confirming uh, the report. Now, we reported from Russia's Far East the last time Kim met Putin in 2019, Kim traveling then by train to Vladivostok. The New York Times quotes U.S. sources saying he plans to do so again this month. In recent years, Kim has more often been seen overseeing his missile program, even uh, taking his young daughter with him. But last month, he met Russia's defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, in North Korea. And this morning, the National Security Council says Shoigu was trying to convince Pyongyang to sell artillery ammunition to Russia for its war in Ukraine. I will say one possibility this morning is that the Biden administration has publicized Putin and Kim's plan in an attempt to try to prevent the meeting from happening and, and a deal uh, being uh, done. We'll find out. It's, it's allegedly, according to The New York Times, uh, coming up pretty quickly. Absolutely. So, Kier, we, some details that we do have here. Russia's defense minister visited North Korea in July. Yesterday, he mentioned the possibility right. uh, specifically of holding joint war games. Right. Tell us more about that detail. Yeah, so this has been muted uh, allegedly by President Putin as well some, some months ago. Uh, this is the idea of uh, some kind of joint uh, China, Russia uh, and North Korea uh, naval exercises. It's been reported by the Financial Times that, that President Putin has invited North Korea um, to those those naval exercises. And, and I mean, clearly, uh, that suggests this kind of attempt by China and Russia to build an alternative to the US uh, sphere of influence around the world. I think it's notable uh, that both uh, China's President Xi and, and Russia's President Putin have said they won't go to the G20, but they'll meet in China mm -hmm. at a meeting uh, for China's uh, trillion dollar uh, One Belt, One Road uh, scheme that, that invests around the world and is part of China's foreign policy. Yeah. Absolutely. Kira, you mentioned, you know, I mean, just putting in context how big of a deal this is. Explain just how serious yeah. the concern is from the U.S. side, this potentially deepening military relationship. That's right. Uh, of course there will be uh, that concern. And I think uh, it's notable that we don't yet know whether President Biden and President Xi will meet, as has been suggested, in the U.S. Uh, later this year. Uh, of course, now we're not entirely certain that President Biden will go to the G20. But we know that uh, President Xi, because of uh, you know, the, in fact, the, the First Lady's COVID infection, but we know that President Xi uh, isn't going to go to uh, the G20. So there has been a lot of effort by the U.S. to, to 
build a kind of diplomatic relationship with China whilst still keeping sanctions, for example, in place. But how that is playing out, I think, is still open to question with these continuing, uh, this continuing partnership between China and Russia and, it seems, North Korea. Absolutely. Keir Simmons, as always, thank you so much for your reporting. Let's stay on international news now, starting with a notable absence at the G20 summit in India, as we're John. discussing. Uh -huh. Josh Letterman joins us with that and more. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. Chinese President Xi Jinping will be the notable absence from that Group of 20 summit taking place uh, this weekend. And we know that this is being seen as a snub to the host country of India because China and India have been in a major dispute for several years over contested territory in the Himalayas. And in fact, just recently, China released a map showing the territory as part of China. And that really bothered the Indians. Now, President Biden is attending the summit and says he is disappointed appointed that President Xi will not be there. Now let's go over to Japan, where the government is furious over China's decision to ban seafood from Japan because of the water being discharged from the Fukushima nuclear power plant, where there was that disaster many years back. Now, China took that step of banning the seafood imports last month after Japan started releasing into water into the ocean that has been treated to reduce the radioactive levels to far below what is safe for humans. Japan now is calling the Chinese seafood ban totally unacceptable. And finally, over to Antarctica, where an Australian who got sick at a remote research station is now safely on his way home to get advanced medical care. Rescuers had to travel more than 1,800 miles on an icebreaker through sea ice from Australia to get close enough to the base where they could then launch a helicopter to go the final stretch. The man should arrive back home in Australia by next week, guys. Wow, what an operation <laughs> what to save him. Oh, that is just incredible. Josh uh, Hederman, thank you so much. Coming up, raising awareness for World Alzheimer's Month. That's right. The Senior Director of Care and Support at the Alzheimer's Association is joining us to discuss the importance of early diagnosis and the strides that are being made when it comes to treating the disease. You are watching Morning News Now. September is World Alzheimer's Month, and it's a disease that causes dis disruptions in memory and behavior. And according to the Alzheimer's Association, currently more than 6 million Americans live with the disease. Well, now a growing number of new treatments are on the horizon to help keep Alzheimer's at bay through early detection. Monica Moreno is the Senior Director of Care and Support at the Alzheimer's Association. She joins us now. Monica, thank you so much for being with us today. It's something I know personally. I lost my grandmother to Alzheimer's, and I just think having this month of recognition must be so, I hope, important and helpful for people, you know, pointing a spotlight on it, raising money for it. Tell us what a month like this focusing on this does for you and your organization. Yeah, good morning, and thank you for having me today. You know, World Alzheimer's Month really provides an opportunity for organizations like the Alzheimer's Association to help raise awareness of Alzheimer's, but other forms of dementia as well. Mm -hmm. And there's still this misperception that Alzheimer's is a normal part of aging. And while we know that there are changes that happen to our brain as we grow older, the Alzheimer's Association developed the 10 warning signs, which may indicate that something more serious is going on. So during the month of September, as well as all other months of the year, the, the goal of the association is really to help educate the public about the warning signs of Alzheimer's disease, the importance of going to see your doctor if you notice even one of these warning signs in yourself or someone else, to get a workup and get a diagnosis, to be able to talk about treatments, and most importantly, to be able to access resources through the Alzheimer's Association, because no one should have to go through this disease alone. Mm. Monica, you touched on the warning signs. Tell us about the importance of that early diagnosis when it comes to this disease. Yeah. And what are the warning signs? Yeah, there's so many benefits to getting early detection and diagnosis. You know, one of the most common warning signs is having difficulty with memory thinking and behavior. I've had a lot of opportunity in my job to talk with those living with the disease. And one of the things that they have shared that really triggered them to know that something more serious was going on was having difficulty doing a familiar task, something that they had done their whole life. I talked to uh, an award-winning chef who couldn't make an omelet one morning and uh, the vice president of wow. a bank who couldn't do simple math problems to help her, her grandchildren with. So these are things that they had done all of their life that came very simple to them, but one day they started having more difficulty. And the difficulty with memory and thinking problems are not just losing your key, right? 
right? These are challenges that are now starting to affect everyday life. Oh. The importance of early detection and diagnosis are many. First being that it allows families to start planning for their future. How do they want to be cared for, the person living with the disease? How are they going to pay for their cost of care? Putting all of their legal and financial plans in place. And the earlier that families are able to do this, the person living with dementia is actually part of that process. Mm. So it really gives peace of mind to the family that when they have to make these difficult decisions in the future, they've actually had those conversations and are carrying out the wishes of the person living with the disease. Yeah. It also provides people the opportunity to participate in clinical trials. The reality is that we would not be where we are today with two new treatments if we did not have healthy volunteers and those living with dementia participating in clinical trials. And then lastly, and most importantly, especially now today that we have two treatments that are available, access to the treatments, whether it's treatments to help address symptoms of the disease or the two new treatments that have been approved by the FDA. Monica, give us more details on those new treatments that have been approved by the FDA. I mean, it really, I just remember when we got this news, it sounded like such a breakthrough, really such a turning point. Tell us about them. It is a turning point. You know, there are two new treatments, um, Adjahelm and Lakembi, that have been approved by the FDA that address one of the underlying causes of Alzheimer's disease. And these treatments, when um, received in the very earliest stage of Alzheimer's disease, can give people more time in the early stage. And this is the time where they're still very independent and they can participate in life and, and contribute to society and really do the things that are most meaningful to them and to their families. And that's why this whole issue of early detection and diagnosis is so critically important. If people wait to go see the doctor, they may not be eligible or uh, appropriate to be able to receive any of these treatments that are really targeting the disease in the very earliest stage. So recognizing what those warning signs are, going to the doctor, getting that work up, and mm. being able to have conversations with your doctor about what are the treatments that are available and that may be most appropriate for you. It's really important. Monica Moreno, thank you so much. Really good tips. Everybody can be watching out for themselves as well as family members. We appreciate your time this morning during this all important month for this research. Thank you. Thank you. Well, coming up, she's got an eye for design. Yeah, we're introducing you to an electrical engineer turned fashion designer who's behind one of Etsy's hottest handbags. Look at that. It's all part of our series, Women Mean Business, up next. Back now with new questions this morning about another music festival meltdown. This one was at the Electric Zoo Festival taking place right here in New York City. <laughs> music festival mayhem in New York City over the holiday weekend. Concert goers seen storming the entrances to the Electric Zoo Electronic Music Festival on Sunday after an announcement that the venue had reached capacity earlier than anticipated and no other ticket holders would be admitted. Oversold. We don't understand how you can oversell uh, tickets. The three-day event had issues from day one. Friday's show was abruptly canceled just hours before the start. One hour before, I was actually just getting ready for to come and I got the news. Festival organizers issuing a statement on social media citing global supply chain disruptions as the reason behind the delay in completing construction of the main stage. You probably knew about this way in advance like probably either yesterday or the day before, and you wait three hours before the event's supposed to start. Seems a little bit ridiculous. Saturday, the doors opening two hours later than originally scheduled. And on Sunday, festival organizers shutting down access around 6.30 that evening. There were people that I met that, were, that flew in from Dallas, Texas. Some people actually came in from Canada. I knew some people came in from Europe. The NYPD arriving to survey the scene using a drone to ensure the crowds inside the gates were safe. We had some concern because when uh, uh, additional people rushed into the concert, we wanted to make sure that uh, people weren't uh, overcrowded or on top of each other. We wanted to make sure that the party goers weren't overwhelmed. 
by the end of the night, those who did manage to enjoy the show spent the rest of the evening just trying to leave, posting videos to social media of a slow-moving, jam-packed crowd trying to get off Randall's Island, where the event was held. Poor management, like they, this could be avoided. They've done this for so many years. The festival announcing refunds would be issued for affected guests, but some say they won't be repeat customers in the future. We're not coming back if they do have it. Like, we're not going to do this festival again. Like, it's not worth it. Festival organizers posted on their social media accounts that anyone who had tickets to Friday, the day that was completely canceled, they will get refunds. Anyone who couldn't get in on Sunday will also get refunds. We reached out to event organizers to find out how those refunds will be issued, but we have not heard back. Oh, wait. I and there was that one guy. It seems definitely. ridiculous. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what a mess. Okay. Financial headlines now. Disney is pushing back amid its dispute with Charter Communications. CNBC Silvana now joins us now with that and other news. Hey there, Silvana. Hey, Valerie. Hey, Savannah. Good morning to you. Yeah, so Disney is urging customers of Charter's Spectrum Cable Service to consider switching to Hulu's live TV option as the companies remain in a dispute over a new distribution deal. Disney says it hopes to reach an agreement to restore access to ABC, ESPN, and other channels that have been blacked out on Spectrum since Thursday. Charter disputes that its dispute stems partly from fees that Disney wants for its programming at a time when cable TV viewers are declining and streaming is on the rise. It's about to get harder to rent an Airbnb in New York City. Starting today, the city will start enforcing a new law restricting short-term rentals. Properties from hosts on sites like Airbnb and VRBO will now have to register with the mayor's office. No more than two paying guests are allowed at a time and hosts must be physically present. Airbnb sued, claiming the law is effectively a ban on short-term rentals, but a judge dismissed the lawsuit last month. And Meta's next Quest Pro VR headset could be a collaboration with LG Electronics. Reports say the new headset could come in 2025 and is rumored to cost around $2,000 and compete directly with Apple's Vision Pro. It would reportedly use LG displays and other parts. Meta could also release a lower-end Quest headset next year that cost under $200. Wow, that is quite a difference in price. Yeah. How much <laughs> lower end are we talking? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Also, just these people still putting out... Making more of them. Such expensive yeah. headsets when it <laughs> seems the metaverse is sort of, you know, the hype around it anyway has kind of yeah. gone down. I know, but people are still into it, apparently. Yeah, I guess so. Savannah Hanau, thank you so much. Sure thing. Went on to the latest edition of our series, Women Mean Business. Maria Gabriela Duque is a trained engineer, but her love for fashion and design helped her discover her true calling, creating custom-made handbags. They are getting a lot of attention. Here's a little bit of her story. As a teenager growing up in Venezuela, Maria Gabriela Duque was having trouble finding a backpack in stores that fit her style. So with her mother's guidance, she learned how to use a sewing machine and created a bag for herself. It would be her first design of many. In college, Maria followed in her engineer father's footsteps and studied electrical engineering, but she was drawn back to fashion, making bags for her and her friends. And soon, she realized there was a niche for her creations. She started an Etsy shop, Mari Gabby Designs, making sustainable and fashionable bags from vegan cactus leather. Working alongside her sister in their home studio, Maria cuts the material from the Nepal cactus and hand embroiders the detail on each bag. Now living in Florida, Maria is being recognized for her work, being named the 2023 Grand Prize Award winner of Etsy's Design Awards. No way. No way. You can't be here. Oh my God. And she's passing down her creativity to her 10-year-old daughter, Isabella. Together, they run a jewelry shop, ensuring her entrepreneurship continues with the next generation. Maria Gabriela Duque is a woman who means business. And she's a woman who joins us now, lucky us. Maria, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Tell uh, us first, let's start with growing up in Venezuela, how your mom and dad inspired and fed your entrepreneurship spirit. And also, I know it had a little bit to do uh, with you ultimately studying electrical engineering. Just tell me about growing up. Um. Well, um, growing up was uh, pretty much the same um, as a normal kid. But... Um, my dad is an engineer. That's why I decided to study engineer back then. 
but my mom was always the creative one. So <laughs> I always had the uh, craft materials at home. And I think he, uh, she was the main inspiration behind all the designs uh, stuff that came back uh, after the engineering. Absolutely. It's just so cool that you studied engineering. I feel like it gives you this like really great balance of the way that you're able to construct your bags and make things, but then also yes. have that creative passion. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I love the construction part of the bag. That's the main um, thing that caught my attention back then. Absolutely. So, okay, let's talk about winning this prize. We were able to see a little bit in that piece we just played of how emotional you were winning the 2023 Grand Prize Award Etsy Design Awards. You have a pretty cool fan who helped handpick this. I mean, Sarah Jessica Parker, a.k.a. Carrie Bradshaw herself, picking your bag as such a fashion icon. Tell us, just tell us about the moment that you found out that you won and just knowing that Carrie Bradshaw's SJP is such a fan. <laughs> oh my god well as you saw on the video i was pretty uh emotional uh i cried for a couple of minutes because um i wasn't expecting that at all <laughs> um it was pretty uh, shocking and um knowing that sarah jessica parker uh, said that my back caught her attention right away was um <laughs> oh my god um i don't know i don't even know how to tell this but it's awesome and <laughs> i never i never thought i could be a, a, win, a grand prize winner of the ethi awards oh it's so cool and what did it do for your business right away once you won that award did it just skyrocket yes this <laughs> like the minute like the minute uh, uh after that it was uh crazy have you been able to keep up with demand? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm doing my best. Uh, but yes, I have my sister helping me and my mom too. So we're uh, doing our best to try to keep up with all orders and messages and everything. Oh, and I love, I love awesome. that all of the things that you create is such a family affair. Your sister, you just mentioned your mom, and then you start this other Etsy shop with your 10-year-old daughter. Uh, that's making jewelry, which is so neat. Before we let you yeah. go, we always love to ask women like yourself who have done something so neat and created something, what's your advice for other young women pursuing their dream who, who maybe don't think you know that they would win a grand prize in something like this, but knowing that it's possible, what's your advice for someone? Um, I would say never um, stop um, showing what you are capable of doing because um, we are all uh, busy with uh, with our life. And if you're a mom, you know, we have uh, such a uh, little time <laughs> to make uh, this kind of thing. So mm. never stop finding that minute, that hour of your day to do something and showing to your friends and your family and if you find some awards that you can participate uh don't hesitate because you know you don't know when you can win and your life will change oh. maria gabriella duque thank you for joining us so cool this business as well as the one with your daughter and also awesome about your bags cactus leather by the way sustainable bags really cool stuff thank you so much for joining thank us it was a pleasure to have you Thank you for having me. <laughs> Coming up, the Stones are back. For the first time in 18 years, the band is set to release new material. We'll tell you how you can get all the details about the new album up next. Welcome back. Well, the Rolling Stones may have just celebrated Mick Jagger turning 80 years old, but they've got no plans to retire. The group just announced they're releasing their first new album of original songs in 18 years. Titled Hackney Diamonds, it comes nearly 60 years since their first album was released. More details on the album are going to come out tomorrow on a YouTube live stream hosted by our Tonight Show host, 
Jimmy Fallon. How cool is that? I can't believe he just turned 80. I know. Isn't that wow, amazing? amazing. <laughs> you wouldn't know it. <laughs> Finally, this hour, the music world is mourning the loss of one of the most iconic voices from the late 90s and early 2000s. And that's right. Steve Harwell, the former frontman for the band Smash Mouth, he died on Monday at his home in Idaho. NBC News Entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas joins us now here on set with the latest on the singer's death. Hey, Chloe, good morning. Good morning. Nice to be here with you all. So, so many people are paying tribute to Steve Harwell. Um, it came as a big surprise. It yeah. felt like to his fans and, and many. And we take a look back on his life and the music that defined a generation. Mm. Hey now, you're an all-star. With hits like All Star and Walking on the Sun. Might as well be walking on the sun. Smash Mouth delivered a list of earworms that became the soundtrack for a generation. On Monday, the band announced that their famous frontman, Steve Harwell, died at 56 from acute liver failure after many health issues. The band's manager telling NBC News, Steve Harwell was a true American original, adding, quote, his only tools were his irrepressible charm and charisma, his fearlessly reckless ambition and his king-sized cojones. Steve lived a 100% full-throttle life. Their biggest hit, All Star, went to number four on Billboard's Hot 100 singles chart and earned them a Grammy nomination. Multiple songs were featured in movies throughout the late 90s and early 2000s, including 10 Things I Hate About You. And then I saw her face. I'm a and 2001 Shrek. Tributes for the singer pouring in on social media and our own Carson writing in part, quote, he brought joy to millions with his music and his legacy will thankfully live on. Back in 2016, the band appeared for today's 90s throwback themed Halloween. Harwell crediting Carson for helping with their start. He got hired to MTV and then he drug us with him. Harwell retired from the band two years ago after appearing disoriented at a concert. At the time, Harwell responding, quote, I've tried so hard to power through my physical and mental health issues and to play in front of you one last time, but I just wasn't able to. So fans are taking to social media to share their favorite moments of listening to Smash Mouth mm -hmm. over the years and their favorite songs, and the tributes keep pouring in, so we're definitely keeping his family and friends um, in our thoughts today. And Absolutely. the music is up a little bit louder. I know, now. right? Oh, it's just, you remember some of those hits. Also, Carson's tribute was really just so beautiful. What a unique and special relationship that he helped them I know. from those radio stations. I know, and I was talking to Carson this morning on the Today Show, and he was just saying that he's talking to other musicians uh, this morning. Morning, and you know they're all mourning the loss. But really, Carson knew um, Steve really from the very early days yeah. of Smash Mouth, and was putting him on the radio, like we were just talking yeah. about. Yeah. Um, and obviously, like there was TRL at some point in there. As yeah, well. yeah. <laughs> so cool, Chloe. Thank you so much, and welcome to NBC. Yes, Good to have you over. Thank, here. You. thank you. Great to see you guys. That does it for this hour of morning news. Now, but the news continues right now. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.